गुड मॉर्निंग नमस्कार आई एम गोइंग टू बिगेन विद क्वेश्चन दैट वी ऑल नीड टू आस्क आर सेल्स एज टू हाउ एजुकेटेड वे रियली आर बिकॉज वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट एजुकेशन एंड वी बिलीव एट दिस कॉन्फ्रेंस इम्प्लाइज विद सो मेनी नॉलेजेबल पीपल अराउंड दैट वी विल बी एबल टू फाइंड आउट वेज ऑफ एजुकेटिंग आर चिल्ड्रन बेटर मोर इफेक्टिवली and maybe more empathetically so let me begin with a story and i as charles said i walk every 6 months in uh, along with 50 60 70 people we have this show the yatras uh, show means to explore yatra means journey so we walk through the villages in summer we go to hot places winter we go to the cold places and learn from people share with them what we know so in one of these walks uh we i met a shepherd now here is a professor from i am thinking himself to be very uh, knowledgeable expert and i thought let us have a little fun so he was taking some about 250 sheep for grazing so i waved hand and said please uh, could you please stop for a minute i want to ask you a question so he stopped lanky tall fellow and i said if one of the sheep in your herd gets mixed with another herd how will you find out i thought i had asked a very smart question so he said he saw a paper in my hand which had the program of this so the yatra so he said please give me this piece of paper so i gave him the piece of paper he looked at it and he said to me all the letters look alike to me all the sheep looked alike i was illiterate in his language he was illiterate in my language but i my naivety knew no limits when i said that look i am going to ask something which probably you might not be able to answer so there is this question that comes up all the time how do we learn and in every walk we learn from four teachers teacher within us who keeps on asking questions sometime very uncomfortable questions question that we don't like teachers around us all the peers teachers in the nature a tree a bird a squirrel and teachers among the common people and how do we learn from these four teachers so that's a question that we all have to ask ourselves because if you imagine for a minute when did we invite a shepherd the one that i met in a classroom anywhere which pedagogy stresses the need for inviting a carpenter who makes beautiful artifacts may not be literate but then in our mind we have got confused between education and literacy of course we need literacy certainly we need literacy but we also need education and education is beyond letters certainly it's beyond letters so we need to learn to unlearn and how do we learn to unlearn so that's how honeybee network started 25 years ago it repurposes the inquiry it questions the fundamentals of what we know and how do we know and is it possible that we can know better so many years ago 85 86 i was in bhutan and there was a teacher who took the children to a monastery young tiny tots of primary school and he gave them a foot ruler you know one foot wooden ruler and he said kids your challenge today is to go around the monastery and measure length and breadth children were very happy they are going to do something and they were out of the class any time you take children out of the class they are very happy you know all over the world that's a universal experience and yet how often we do that so that teacher gave their, everybody had brought their ruler said so they started measuring the breadth the length of the monastery now monastery as you know is made of wood so when they started doing that they, there came a pillar and pillar had a different wood than the wood that was used in the wall then came a, a door and the frame of the door had a different wood than had the doors and they began to ask teachers questions they said teacher what kind of wood this is teacher said oh this one oh you know what this is a wood of that tree where does this tree grow teacher children asked oh that tree grows at that altitude when will you take us to see the tree then they saw on some panels the rings and one student out of mischievous nature that children always are started measuring the distance between the rings can you imagine what what is happening here the class is now getting into the class on 
ecology, class on growth, class on physiology, class on how the tree rings tell you the imprints of climate change. Oh my God, the teacher can take them to any extent that he wishes to do. All with simple ruler that was used to measure the length and breadth of the monastery. So there are, there are huge opportunities that we have for redefining what education is and focus a little less on the content, a little more on the vessel, the vessel in which we try to put the content as if these are only repositories of whatever the expertise that we have. So there are a few questions that Honeybee Network has asked us all to think about. And one of that question is about accountability to oneself. If I collect knowledge, do I make those people anonymous? So if you see the logo, there is a nameless, faceless person who comes in contact with the network, gets an identity. How do we tell our children that it is useful to, to acknowledge when we learn something? You know, many of you are scholars, and if you look at the research papers published in various journals, and find out the number of personal communications given in the bibliography, you will be amazed to find so few of them. Are you saying that we can learn, any professional can learn, without having talked to people in the corridor? Not possible. Then why do personal communications occur so few, so rarely? Because the culture of citing people's personal incidental conversations has not as become so strong. But if it becomes strong, don't you think conversations will become more interesting, more frequent, more useful? Yes, we will have a society where people will share more because they have no risk, no fear, no worry about what will others do with my ideas. So please remember that it is very useful to practice the values that we want to communicate to others. It also helps to it also helps in terms of asking out what is the purpose? Is there one purpose that we're trying to achieve through education? Are there many purposes? Honeybee Network has asked this question for all the years. Are we trying to learn from the things or we are trying to learn from thoughts? The more things you have, the less thoughts you have. Frugality actually is to influence what Wisdom is to knowledge. You have a lot of wisdom, a lot of knowledge, not necessarily a lot of wisdom. I was naive when I had asked that question to the shepherd. I, had, I lacked the wisdom. I had knowledge. I lacked the wisdom. And that's what the shepherd taught me. So it, Honeybee Network is asking questions about open source content. There is a, there are a problem. I was talking to Malik. He said, look, in Afghanistan, there is a problem. We don't have many good teachers. I said, that is a wonderful opportunity. If there are not many teachers, wonderful. Now we can think of a democratic model which teachers would never have allowed us to implement. You know? So let us convert this crisis into opportunity and let us have large-scale multimedia, multi-language content, open source content, and make it available to people as effortlessly as possible. You know, children can do wonders. Children can do wonders with simple tools. A foot ruler could do the things that maybe a very costly computer and other things might not have achieved. So the pedagogies which are frugal, which require few materials, things around us are very democratic, are very inclusive. They involve wisdom, the wise of the wisdom, the wise of the wisdom. And of course, living with less to have more requires us to dispense things that we don't need. So can I dispense with a few things? So why does education reinforce inertia and not innovation? That's another question that I want to ask. And I have seen this in my life. Let me show you. These three examples that you see here have been there with us for centuries. All of you have taken a cup of tea in the morning. How many of you reflected on the fact that when this lady lifts, cuts, or picks up the leaves, the birds from the tea, brush, tea bush, she picks it up, puts it in the basket behind, and she does it 2,000, 3,000 times. Try to do it 10 times, 5 times. Just now, if you try to do that, you will know where the pain occurs. But when we take a cup of tea, the pain does not occur to us. We don't experience the pain. In the lunchtime today, I'm sure many of you will eat rice. How many of you know that this lady in this posture walks for miles, if you come to add up all the distance that she walks for transplanting paddy from field to field, keeping her feet in the water, feet develop ulcers, pain in the back. And for all these years, we have lived with it. So is with the stove. So there is a, some, there's something systematic. It is incidental. No, no, no. There's a systematic pattern that all the three are 
women-based activities. It's not just by chance. It's not that I want to pick up these three examples. You will invariably find inertia far more evident in the activities that engage women than men. And that is a reflection, a sad reflection, on the way we prioritize things in our science and technology system, in our public policy, in our educational system. Something which distracts our attention away from those pain points that bother our society so persistently for centuries together, and we don't seem to get moved. So what do we do? We need to ask ourselves a question. And let me tell you another story. Many of you might have heard this story. A person was walking along the seashore, and there was a lady watching him. So, look, so the waves of the sea were throwing a lot of starfishes on the shore. And this person would walk and pick up a few starfishes and throw them back into the sea. So the lady asked him, what are you doing? You think you can save all of these thousands of starfishes that waves are throwing up, throwing back at the shore? He picked up one, threw it back and said, I can save this one. And this is the spirit which overcomes inertia. I can't solve all the problems. Surely I can't solve all the problems, but I can solve this one. And let me try to solve this one. And there is no argument, there is no argument for those who take initiatives, because they have only one argument, that they would like to at least throw one starfish back into the sea. And that works. That's how we must ask this question. We have so much of knowledge, and we feel about this much, and we act only on this much. Isn't it true? There is an inverted triangle where knowledge is expanding, Feelings are constricting, and actions sometimes disappear. If this is the purpose of education, we must ask ourselves hard. This is not what education can ever achieve in transforming our society. I'm not saying we should have less knowledge. I'm not saying that at all. I'm indeed saying we should have a little more feelings. And I'm indeed saying that some of the feelings, many of these feelings, should convert into action, initiative, even if we fail. So what? So how do we express how do we share, how do we reinforce our naivety? Once I went to North Gujarat, uh, it's a semi-arid region, dry region. We, were, we went there to meet a healer, Karim Bhai. Karim Bhai Sumara is a, was a, is a potter, makes earthen clay pots, but he also is a healer, herbal drugs he makes, dispenses to the people around. And there is a sanctuary, uh, Jasor and Balaram, sanctuary for slot beer. So we were sitting outside the sanctuary. His hut, hut was very near the jungle. And there, was a, there were stones. So we asked him to, requested him to sit on one of the rocks. And when he sat there, there was a photographer with me, Jayanti Bhai. He uh, asked, Professor, can you give him a twig? So I plucked a twig from a plant growing uh, vigorously on the roadside and gave it to him to hold it in his hand. And Karim Bhai became upset. I said, what happened, Karim Bhai? Did I do something wrong? He said, did we need this twig? I said, it would look nice in the frame of the photograph, so in the film, and I, that's the reason why the filmmaker wanted it to be in your hand. He said, then you could have told me I would have sat near the plants. And like a fool, I made a statement. I said, but there are so many of them around the roadside. What if I took one twig? And he said, what did you say, Professor? So many? In nature, there is never too many. My God, here is a professor who has studied ecology, biology. By training, I'm a geneticist. And I could make a statement that there were too many of these plants around the road, because I was naive, I was foolish, I was ignorant of the fact that nature never produces anything more than what is needed. There is no concept of waste in nature. And here is a healer telling me that lesson, which I had forgotten. But this healer is illiterate. How can he be a key stakeholder in the education system? We have not thought about that. And I think this is the challenge. This is the challenge that we need to recognize that from when we want to move from inertia to innovation, we will have to learn from teachers who so far have never been part of educational system. We have never considered knowledge-rich, economically poor people to be part of teaching community. They are not teachers. Tell me one school around the world which has invited such people every week to teach our children, to share with them what they know, and to challenge them. So we need to look at now the fulcrum of sustainability, and how can these frugal innovations become the fulcrum of sustainability. This is a bridge on which we walked in Meghalaya, Magriat village, northeast of our country, Chirapunji district, we received the maximum rainfall in the world. Here is a bridge, a bridge 
made by pulling the roots of the trees from two sides of the river. Now, there are easier ways of making bridges. I'm sure you know them all. Why did it take this trouble of pulling the roots from two sides of the river to draw them together to make a bridge, having some pebbles around which the roots twine and grow? This could become possible because there were three things. Of course, there's a technology that you need, how to do that. But you also need institutions. You need a culture of creativity, which pushes you to try a solution which is unconventional, which is different. And in terms of frugality, there is practically zero entropy in this, very little. So if technology is like words, institutions are like grammar, and culture is like Thesaurus. We need all the three, all the three, to be able to generate a sustainable solution. These are the three pillars that will inevitably be required, without which we will not be able to go forward. Let me give you another example how communities teach. We were walking through Purulia, Bankura, West Bengal, in one of the Shodh Yatras in summer. We came across this site. Beautiful terracotta horses lying under a tree. It seemed strange, so we requested the porters of the village who had made these beautiful terracotta horses and said, look, you have kept these horses here, somebody could take them away, somebody could, somebody could break them. Why did you do that? Why did you put such beautiful horses under a tree? The elderly potter said, I had by now, by then I had introduced myself, I'm a professor, I'm, we are walking together to learn, celebrate the creativity, etc. He said, you made a small mistake. I said, what happened? These are not the beautiful ones, these are the best ones that we have made. Why did you keep the best ones under the tree? So that when our children walk by this street, they know what the current standard of the best is, they must do better. Open source standards of excellence. Tell me which school, which management book has this lesson? I have been teaching for the last 30 and odd years in a management institute, one of the top institutes of our country and of that part of the world, and I didn't find any book which can tell me that open source standard of excellence created by communities can be a great propeller for pursuit of excellence among the children. Now, this is wisdom. And the curricular reforms, educational redesigning, are, you look at any report, pardon my saying this, but look at any report of UNESCO or UNICEF or any international organization, and show me one paragraph on this concept of open source standards of excellence created by the communities. Why don't we have them? And unless we have them, how do we create commitment and curiosity and compassion among our children for pursuing these goals? So let me give you a few more examples now, and I will show you these examples. This is from a primary school in Jharkhand. We were having a show, the Atra. We walked. Normally, there's a one hand pump. If there's one hand pump, children have to drink water during the recess. The younger kids sometimes are bullied by the older kids, and they remain thirsty. They are not able to get their chance by the time recess is over, and it's not very nice. Young kids not getting enough chance to drink water. So this fellow created six different taps instead of one, cost only about Three dollars. This contraption costs only three dollars. Three dollars. That is the problem. This will never replicate. You understand? This will never replicate because it costs so less. If it was costing three hundred dollars, maybe there would have been a contractor interested in submitting a project and getting contract, and there will be some officer who will process the file, and the budget will get allocated. Because it costs less, we find a great challenge. And I would like all of us to feel challenged that how do we create a public administration, a policy framework? How do we create rethinking among the, in the minds of the foundations which fund these projects? None of them realize that many times to do great things, you need small monies, but you need a lot of coordination, you need a lot of motivation, you need a lot of pedagogies, pedagogical experimentation. See further. Here is the teacher. And what does she do? Priti Ban said, look, I have a library in this school, but children don't really use it as much. I, she took 50 boxes from a good, uh, small company nearby, requested the people in the company donate 50 boxes. In each box, she kept 15 books, three of them reference, dictionary and so on, 12 different books. Each box had different books. She will give this box for a month to each child, a take-home library. Now, here are books at the house, at the home of the child, and anybody can read them. The 
Family can read them, neighbors can read them, parents can read them, anybody can read them. If you don't know reading, at least turn the pages, see the pictures, whatever you wish to do. In a year, a child is getting access to 120 books. Can you believe it? I don't know of any public school, for that matter, any private school or any uh, you know, outstanding international school, which will be able to make children read 120 books a year. Here is a standard that the teacher has created. Let's see another example. Our friend Thakarshi Bhai Kanbar had a problem. The problem was, many children were not coming to school. So what do you do? Children are not coming to school. So he, at that time, the postcard costed 10 pesa, which means one-tenth of a rupee. In one dollar, there are 60 rupees. So you can imagine what I'm talking about. He bought, he looked at, there's a record of all the births in the village. So he went to the village, Chakidar, village PN, collected all the children born in the last five years. Made a list. Bought, there were 300 children. So he bought 300 postcards, 30 rupees, 50 cents, and started sending postcard to every child on his or her birthday. Now, in villages, people don't keep track of the birthday generally. But when the parents got this card, they came to the teacher. Teacher, you sent this card, what for? He looked at the card. Oh, I'm waiting for a child after four years. I'm waiting for a child after three years. I'm waiting for a child after six months. I'm waiting for a child after one year. They said, what? You're reminding us four years in advance? Of course, you sometimes forget, you know. Mind you now, in 50 cents, he has solved a problem which World Bank, under district primary education program, with $5 million every district, couldn't solve. There is something to be said about frugality. He could do in 50 cents what large corporations, large foundations are not able to do with millions of dollars. There is something strange about it. Why are frugal solutions so effective then? We need to ask this question. We need to ask the questions about morality of frugality. What is the moral basis? So let's look at how do we learn now from children themselves. Yes, so there is a rickshaw here, and we organized competitions on 19th November. Dr. Kalam, our former president, who has met probably more children than any head of the state ever in the history of humankind, he will come to our campus on 19th November and give award to children who send their ideas. We get them fabricated into products and services and file patents for them if necessary. So here is a kid who gave this idea of co-creation. Why can't the passenger also co-paddle? along with the driver, because sometime on the steep climb, it doesn't work. So there is a, another example. This girl has made a walker, which can also work on the stairs. So what are we trying to do? We are trying to blend passion, purpose, performance in the platform. And how do we do that? You need different ways of learning. We don't have to learn from an innovation only in its artifactual sense. We should also learn its metaphor. We should learn at the level of heuristics, and we should also learn at the level of just all. There are four different levels at which we can learn from these ideas and apply them wherever we want. Our president, Pranam Mukherjee Saab, is inaugurating National Innovation Club in every university where he goes. Every school should have a National Innovation Club. And what would it do? Search, spread, sense, and celebrate. Search creative ideas, spread creative ideas, sense the unmet needs of society, and of course, invite these achievers in the school or college and celebrate their achievements. So we have many examples of students. Techpedia.in is a platform that we made where 170,000, 74,000 engineering projects have been pulled, pursued by 400,000 students. Why are we doing this? Because we want these students who have been in school earlier to make open source content, to share lessons with the children, and of course, with the, solve the problem of the industry. So large number of solutions, I will not take more time. Just give one example of how creative the students can be and how naive can we be. You all have refrigerators in a house. How many of you have ever realized that there's a refrigerator which keeps things cool, also produces heat? Yes, there's a compressor. Is there any company in the world which uses this heat as a part of the design of refrigerator? None. So this little boy, you know, from a very small college in a small town, put a heat exchanger alongside the compressor, took the heat, made a hot chamber, gives you hot water, keep the food warm, and when you take the heat away from the compressor, it uses less electricity, so now you have a fridge which uses less electricity and gives you more output. 
This is the essence of frugal innovation that we are talking about in the Indian model of Gandhian innovations, in the Indian model of grassroots innovations. And there are a large number of such solutions. You can go, and sometimes China has discovered the same solution that India is discovering. In this age, we cannot afford to rediscover the wheel all the time. We must encourage cross-pollination of ideas across civilizations, across continents. And I invite you all to see how we can force this triangle, innovation, investment, enterprise. Show me how many social venture funds exist which invest in the innovative ideas of primary school teacher. Show me one fund, such fund, anywhere in the world. We don't have such funds. And that shows the naivety, the blinkers on the eyes of the policy makers. Even if there are some, maybe there are localized funds. But there is no global effort, there is no national effort. At least in my country, there is no national effort. Let me put it this way. In India, a country of a billion odd people, we don't have a social venture fund which invests in the ideas of teachers. Let, us, let me put it this way. Other countries might have. So let me close by saying that there are lots of opportunities here. A lot of opportunities. Teacher learn from students, students learn from communities, community create open source standard of excellence, and therefore we will have a role reversal. No, 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 we will have a role peripheral. We will change the way teaching is done. We will change the way cross-pollination of ideas is done. And hopefully, when creativity pervades, innovation instigate, knowledge hum makes us humble, and wisdom will sustain. The last, let me remind you, today is 31st October. That's why I've kept the pumpkins here. You know, it's a very sacred day for many communities in the world. Isn't it true? And we don't mind when we see these pumpkins because that is an irrational part of our consciousness. How can pumpkin keep the, the demons away, the bad spirits away? But that's what the festival of Halloween is supposed to do. Children wonder what these people do. They do one thing. They tell us in the school that only rational structure of thought will help. And here is something they are doing which is completely irrational. We must help children to see the fact that sacred and the spiritual and the sacred and the secular intertwine all the time in our life. And we must not let them be alienated from the sacredness of life. Thank you so much.